Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's great to see you. If you're here in person, if you're watching online, I can't see you, but you can see me, which doesn't seem fair, but here we are. Uh, it is a good Sunday. It's going to be, like, I know that this is second service, like the last part of second service, but like we got so much other stuff happening today. It's a great day to glorify God. Uh, if you have not planned on coming tonight, uh, whatever you have planned, just change that. It's that simple. It really is that simple. So show up uh, tonight, six o'clock. Uh, this morning, we are continuing in our series we're calling Home. In this series, we've been talking about the new vision for Lighthouse Church. If it is your first time, or maybe it's your first time watching online, over the last year, we as a church have been praying and asking God for what vision he would have for us as a church. And the vision uh, that we have, we, we've been talking about the last two weeks. And we, we talked about this concept of home two weeks ago. And last week, if you weren't able to be with us last week, I would highly encourage you go online and watch uh, the video. Uh, we had a elder panel um, where our four elders, we sat here and we had conversation and, and shared some testimony about what this concept mean, means to us. So if you weren't able to be here and you didn't watch it online, go back and watch it. Uh, I promise during one of the services, someone referenced Talladega Nights and there's a Ricky Bobby quote in there somewhere. Um, it's not by me, I can tell you that much. Um, so make sure you go and look for that Easter egg. Uh, it, it, I, I, it would be a good time for you to go and, and watch that. This morning we are continuing in this series of home. And today we're talking a little bit more about this concept of inviting. Uh, part of what we know that home means is home is a place to belong and home is also a place, place to invite others in. When you are invited to something that fulfills a need or desire, the satisfaction you feel is belonging, right? There's a formula. And the formula goes, we as human beings are born with a need to belong, right? There's lots of scientific information about this. Two weeks ago in our notes, we posted some links. You can go and check those out. But we are born with this innate desire to belong with something. So the formula goes, need for belonging plus invitation equals belonging, right? That we equal fulfillment. And so when we are invited and then we, we, we go to a place and we no longer feel like we don't belong, but then we feel like we do belong. So one of the things you're going to see today as we're going through this is this sense of belonging is the solution uh, to, to many of, the, of many people's problems, including our own. Our vision for a church, though, as a whole is this right here. This is what we've been basing it off of. Lighthouse is a home for our community to glorify God and enjoy his presence. Because the truth is, when we asked people in our community, when we did ask them, what do you know about Lighthouse Church? What they said is, oh yeah, you're the church next to Lazy Boy. And while that's something, it's not nothing, we don't want, I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known as Lighthouse as a home for our community. And so this is what we are striving for. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit more about the concept of home, a concept of belonging, and the concept of invitation. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever felt unsure if you were invited or welcomed somewhere? Like you were unsure of the invitation that you heard was for you? you? Maybe you're standing in a group of people and they're all talking about plans that have been made. You're not excluded from the conversation, but no one has actually said, Joel, you're also invited to join us at the movie. There was supposed to be laughter there, right? <laughs> ha ha, come on, guys. You've been awake significantly longer than first service. This is a consistent problem. We're going to have to have a meeting about this and form a committee. Talk about the lack of laughing in second service. I don't love one service more than the other. I just love the one that laughs the most at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I don't care. <laughs> Have you ever felt that though? I mean, have you ever been like been unsure if an invitation was for you? Yes, no, like you can out loud say things. That's right. I grew up Baptist. We said amen a lot in church. <laughs> yes, right. It's awkward, right? Maybe you are. You're standing in a group of people and you're like, I know we're talking about plans, but no one ever explicitly said I was welcome to join. Lots of people are talking about an event, but no one ever said like, this is for you also. It's an awkward place to be. When you question your invitation, you feel like an outsider and are acutely aware of your desire to belong. Like nobody invited me to the movie, but I want to, I want to go see it. I mean, I didn't before I didn't know I was not maybe invited, but now I really want to like be included. We have this desire to belong, this desire to be included. This morning, 
We're going to look at some stories of Jesus because I think Jesus shows us how to invite others into a place of belonging. Jesus was a master at inviting other people in. And we're going to look at several examples of stories in scripture where we see him. And here's the thing. These stories are going to be familiar stories to you. And there's a lot of theology that we could go into each of these, but we're not. So we're going to go through each four of these pretty quickly to look at how Jesus invited other people in. Sound good? Yes. All right, because following the model of Jesus will help us accomplish our mission to be a home for our community. So the first way that we see that Jesus invites people is that Jesus invited others through personal context. He doesn't just repost something on social media and hope that other people see it. And here's the thing. Us, we, our church has a pretty decent social media. We put out a lot of good content. But just sharing that, hey, Lighthouse Church is having a worship night. That's not in inviting. Now, here's the not, side note. We want you to do that. That does help us. It helps our community are just aware that we exist. That doesn't count, though, as an invitation. So do all of that. Share our social media posts. But know that that doesn't fill the prerequisite of, not prerequisite, that does not fulfill the, the request that we have for you to invite someone. Got it? Yes. You know what's better than that, though? Than share, just sharing a post? Caring enough to invite someone personally. Jesus was keenly aware of others. And he used what he knew about them to affirm their value. I want to show you this passage. And this is a passage that's going to be familiar to most all of you. Matthew 4, 18 through 19. It is where Jesus calls Peter to be a disciple. This is not the first time Jesus has met Peter. We know through the other gospels, he's actually had some interactions with him before, but this is where he asks him to follow him. He invites them into it. Look, look at what it says. Walking, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. That's what fishermen do. They fish. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? Most of us have heard this verse before, right? Not a crazy, unheard of verse. Not one of those obscure ones in the super gold sections of your Bible. No, like we've heard this verse. In fact, when I was six, we had a VBS that was all about this. But here's what I love about this passage that I think when we have been in church for a while that we kind of get a little bit immune to is that Jesus contextualized the invitation for fishermen. He didn't just say, follow me. In other places in scripture, he does. He just says, follow me. But he looks at these two fishermen and go, hey, you guys are fishermen? Cool, follow me and you will learn to fish for men. He makes it personal to them. He makes the invitation to Peter and Andrew something that was personal for them and in their context. Inviting others to Lighthouse Church should be a personal conversation that reflects a caring heart for others to find a place to belong. You know, Peter had his moments as a disciple. Sometimes he was pretty good disciple. Sometimes it's pretty bad. After the resurrection of Jesus and after the ascension, he was really, really good at, at pushing the name of Jesus and pushing the kingdom of Jesus forward. He was a really bad fisherman though. But it was still the avenue that Jesus used to meet him where he was. The invitation was personal for Peter. It was specific for Peter. Here's how, here, here's the, my fear of what, what happens when we feel the need to invite someone is that we let this awkwardness take over and we give these kind of vague invitations or maybe it's just me, but like we give an invitation like to something like, Hey, you know, I go to this church. It's called Lighthouse. Yeah. They have a couple services on Sunday. That's where I go. That's not an invitation. That's an information. Like we give people information and expect them to respond to information when people often need an invitation. Instead, we, we should be specific with our invitations and personal in the context we are in, in relationship, in, in, in conversations with people we know. Hey, I go to Lighthouse Church. We have two service times. We have one at nine o'clock or, or this is the second service. We have one at 10, 
30 on Sunday mornings. That's the one we're going to. Would you like to join me? You see, that's a yes or no question. But what we do is we want to give people outs because we feel awkward. Like if you're not doing something or you're not busy or the Broncos are playing, like whatever, like, you know, you don't have to, but, but you could maybe, but don't worry about it. Like we're so general because we're afraid of being awkward that we make ourselves more awkward. If there's no invitation, how can someone say yes to your invitation? So here's my challenge. Be specific. Be personal and be specific. Hey, we've worked together for two years and we've talked about Jesus some. I want to let you know, I know that you've been looking for a church home. My church is called Lighthouse. We believe that, that everyone belongs there. We believe we should be a home for our community. I go to the 1030 service. Would you join me this week? That's specific. That's a yes or no. We want to guard ourselves. What if they say no? What if I feel rejected? But sometimes we've got to be willing to risk it. Because what if we don't invite someone and they really needed that place of belonging? Let me, let me do an exercise with you. That's okay. This is, an, this is a response exercise, so I'm going to ask a question, and I want you to respond. Okay? First question is this. Would you agree that following Jesus is the most important decision of your life? Yes. None of them are trick questions, by the way, just so, just so you know. All right. Yes. Okay, good. We're doing good so far. Would you also agree that being part of the local church is an important part of following Jesus? Yes. 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 Okay. If the answer is no, you're in a weird place for a Sunday morning. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. Would you agree that next to Jesus, your spouse is the most important relationship in your life? This is if you're married. I saw someone elbow their spouse just then. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, next to Jesus. Again, no trick questions. Your spouse is the most important relationship in your life. Jesus says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. All right, it's a pretty important relationship, okay? All right, would you agree, you're gonna see where we're going here in just a second, that proposing to your spouse or being proposed to should be something that is personal? Yes! You shouldn't propose to someone like, hey, everybody else is getting married. I guess we should do it too. That's not personal. You don't post on social media feeling cute, may propose today, may delete later. You don't do that. Like, that's not a thing. It's personal. Like, guys, if you didn't plan out your proposal, if you just said, hey, let's get hitched, like, there's something wrong and you should not be married, probably. All right? No, it's personal. So, yes. Last question. If all of those are yes, then wouldn't it make sense that inviting others to belong to a local church and to deepen their relationship with Jesus should also be personal? Yes. 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 How are we doing? Good. You all passed. Well, there was a stronger yes at the beginning. Yes. Invitations to church should be personal and specific and require a yes or a no. Jesus didn't just show us how, uh, how to be personal in, in context with invitation, but we also see the second thing we see is that Jesus invited those searching for answers. In Luke chapter 19, there's a verse or there's, there's a passage that, that we read about this man named Zacchaeus. And it says this, he, this is Jesus. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not. Because he was small in stature. And so he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Grumble, grumble. That's the JSV, the Joel Standard Version. He, was, he has gone, this is the people grumbling, by the way. He has gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner? And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. 
And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Let me ask this question. When you think of Zacchaeus, what do you think of? The song. What about the song? He was a wee little man. Uh, It's Irish for some reason for me. And a wee little man was he. (laughs) Apparently Zacchaeus was a leprechaun for me as a child when I was growing up. At one point I associated him with lucky charms also. Like what part of the Bible says he's after my lucky charms? Like it's not in there. He was short. That's what people know about Zacchaeus. He was short and he was a tax collector, right? That's the two main things that we know about Jesus. I mean, Jesus, Zacchaeus. Jesus was not a tax collector. I don't know how tall he was. (laughs) Jesus was not a tax collector. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. But I want to I want to suggest something else. I want to point out another attribute that we see of Zacchaeus. That's this. Zacchaeus was searching. Verse three says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. So here's this tax collector. He's probably Irish and a leprechaun, apparently. And he hears Jesus is coming to town. He's like, oh, I've got to see. And so he, 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 he wants to know more about who Jesus is or who this guy is. There's something about him that piques this sense of searching and curiosity in Zacchaeus. So he climbs a tree to see who Jesus is. And I love what happens next because Jesus' invitation, you know, we see Jesus, he's a master of invitation, invite people all the time to follow him or to be part of the kingdom of God. But with Zacchaeus, he reverse invited him. He was like, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. But while Zacchaeus joyfully received Jesus because he was searching The reaction of others in Jericho shows how unwelcome Zacchaeus was. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the idea of outsiders here in just a second. But but Zacchaeus didn't didn't really feel like he belonged. Because he didn't, right? Jesus didn't go into the house because Zacchaeus was rich. He went to the house of Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus needed salvation. Jesus knew it. Zacchaeus knew it. And the people of Jericho knew it. It wasn't a secret. And I love what happened afterward. Because the thing that made the difference wasn't knowing that Zacchaeus was a sinner. What made the difference was that when Zacchaeus was searching for Jesus, Jesus was also seeking him. And when Zacchaeus was looking, he found a place to belong. And here's the really cool part. It made an impact on his whole community. He gave to the poor. He, he gave refunds to people he'd, he'd stolen from. The evidence of faith was present in the life of Zacchaeus. He was a man searching who found Jesus and who impacted his community. People in our community are searching for a place to belong. And it is our job to invite them to church and invite them to be the church. We don't just want people to show up. We want people to feel like they belong here. That's part of being the church. If you're new or if it's your first time, or you're pretty recently started attending Lighthouse or maybe watching online, right? We're not a group of consumers. We believe that we are to be the church. You don't have to be here six weeks before you can be the church. Show up on Sunday. Tell me you want to serve. We'll have a conversation, but we'll get you plugged in because we believe in inviting people to belong to church and to be the church. Because sometimes it takes an invitation to make a difference, but sometimes it takes an invitation for somebody else to make a difference. Let me give you, let me share a story with you about this. Most of you have probably never heard of Albert McMacken. Right? Anybody? Albert McMacken? In 19... Yeah, you were here first service, little drummer boy. In 1937, McMacken invited his high school friend to hear a traveling evangelist who was putting on a revival crusade. And in 1937, Albert McMacken invited his friend to hear a traveling evangelist named Mordecai Ham preach. 
To sweeten the deal, McMahon let his friend drive his truck to the crusade to get him to go. Well, his friend went to the crusade, drove his truck, went to the crusade and loved it. And he went back the next night and the next night and started taking notes. And on November 1st, 1937, Billy Graham made a decision to follow Jesus. And I know you've heard of Billy Graham. See, Billy Graham's ministry is unrivaled in contemporary culture. An estimated 2.2 million people were saved in response to his preaching and countless others due to personal conversations. I read uh, personal accounts people had of meeting Billy Graham and like time after time after time in the conversation, he would just go, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Like, I, like he just that simple. He gave that invitation over and over and over. He gave thousands, probably tens of thousands of invitations for people to follow Christ. We've heard of Billy Graham. You can trace it all back to one invitation from his high school friend, Albert McMacken. And that one invitation would lead to invitation after invitation after invitation for people to follow Jesus. I, for one, am very glad that Albert McMahon invited, or McMacken invited Billy Graham to that crusade. You see, don't underestimate the power of your invitation for someone else to be the church. Zacchaeus was searching. When people are searching, God is usually stirring and he wants to do something. Don't underestimate the power of an invitation. Right? Jesus, number three, also invited outcasts into a home of belonging. No one likes being, feeling like they're trapped on the outside. That's not a good feeling. When you desire to be like at the cool kids table at lunch, but you don't get to sit at the cool kids table at lunch, like you want to be there. You're here like smirking, like I sit at the cool kids table, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's cool to be there. I did not get to sit at the cool kids table at lunch. I did not belong. I felt like an outsider. My very first night in the dorm, I had this feeling of an outsider. You see, I was 18. I just graduated high school. I was moving to, from Lubbock, Texas to Abilene, Texas. Our parents came. They drove me and my best friend, Jeffrey, right? He's preached here a couple times, right? We, we were roommates in college our freshman year. We're going to Hardin-Simmons University in Anderson Hall. And our parents drove us. We unpacked our dorm room. Our moms set everything up. <laughs> like our moms are then like crying. And we're like, okay, see you later. And they leave. And it's like, finally, freedom. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. I can do whatever I want. And in Abilene, Texas, late at night, there's just not that many options. <laughs> so we did what most college kids in Abilene, Texas did in 2004. We went to Walmart because they were open. We walked around. We got some stuff. We drove through Wendy's, picked up a Frosty because they were also open. Got back to the door. It's like 2, maybe 2.30. But you know what? We don't have parents around. We're living on our own. Except here's the thing about Hardin Simmons dorms. They, the doors lock at midnight. And we knew this, but they gave us these cool little key cards. And we swipe them, punch in a number, the doors unlock, we go into our room. Our nice, warm dorm rooms that have, actually at that time of year, is cool dorm rooms because it's hot outside. And the beds are there and all our stuff is there. And it's clean for probably the only time in my college career. <laughs> Except here's the thing. Our key cards didn't work. I swiped my card, punched in my number. And I remember this sound very distinctly, this do, 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 to let me know I was an outsider. And all of the rest of the people in the dorm were all insiders. And that is where they were sleeping. We happened to be like the last people out at Hardin Simmons that night because there was no one else around. Come to find out later is that we originally were assigned a different dorm room. And the week before, we'd had them switch it because we wanted a cooler dorm room but our cards were assigned to the wrong dorm. And there was nothing that felt more like a failure on my very first night away from home, being locked out of the dorm, not being able to get inside. You can look at several different stories and scriptures of outsiders. We just read one about Zacchaeus, but I want to look at this one in John chapter four. The one about the Samaritan woman. 
It says that a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. By the way, and we're, we're abbreviating this for time, right? This is the sixth hour of the day. It's not normally a time where you would go to get water, so it's kind of weird that Jesus is there. It's also kind of strange that a Samaritan woman shows up. And just to give you context, Samaritans and Jews did not get along, right? In fact, Jews looked down on Samaritans. They thought they were less than. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that, that is saying to you, give me a drink, he would have asked him, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. You didn't even bring a rope and bucket. Again, JSV version. Where did you get the living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well to drink from it himself and, and did his sons and his livestock. Jesus, answered, said, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. It's a lengthy passage. I want to encourage you, go read it today. John chapter four. But here's what we know about this woman. We find this out through other contexts of, of, of the passage. Is that she was an outsider. One, she was a Samaritan, so she wouldn't, be belo she wouldn't belong at the well when Jews were drawing water. And two, she wasn't just a Samaritan. She had had some relationship issues. She'd been married several times. The person she was living with then was not her husband. She was considered an outsider. The woman went to the well in the sixth hour because she was an outsider. She went when no one else would be there in the heat of the day. Except there was someone there. Someone who we learned earlier is keenly aware of people and their context. And so when Jesus looks at the woman at the well and says, I can give you something so much greater than this water. What he's doing is lovingly inviting the woman who felt like an outsider into a place of meaningful and spiritual acceptance. The woman was so overcome by her interaction with Jesus that Jesus is actually revealing to her that he is the Messiah. You know what she does? I love this. She's so overwhelmed that she feels like she belongs that it breaks down the walls of the outsider, right? Because we do this. When we feel like an outsider, we put up these, these security, right? Why did she go to the well at the sixth hour? Because it's a security measure for her. She doesn't want to interact with other people. She doesn't want to be told. She doesn't want people just to point out how much of an outsider she is. So she isolated herself. But all of a sudden, when she found out the truth about who Jesus is, and she receives this spiritual, meaningful acceptance, she runs and tells everybody, Come and see, come and see. Because her invitation to belonging led to her inviting other people to a place of belonging. There are people that we interact with on an everyday basis that feel like they don't belong at Lighthouse Church because of who they are or what they've done. This past week, there's a restaurant and pub back here. It's honestly a little more pub than restaurant. But on Wednesday nights, I go eat dinner there. During, during students, I go there and I work on my schoolwork. They have decent Wi-Fi. And I work on my, my schoolwork. I eat dinner there. And I'm sitting there kind of in the back and there's trivia going on and it's loud. And I'm, I'm kind of minding my own business trying to get my schoolwork done. And this woman walks up to me and goes, hey, they told me that you're a pastor. I was like, yeah, yeah. And I know the owners and... They know me. They know where I work. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I was honestly a little caught off guard. And I think she'd been enjoying a little bit more of the pub than the restaurant side of the place. <laughs> and she told me, well, if you're a pastor and you're willing to, to work here, like to, to sit here and do your work, 
oh, that's a church I'm going to go to. I'm going to come to your church. And so I told her, well, just so you know, we have service at 9 and 10.30. You're more than welcome. Now, I should have been more specific and said, hey, will you come this week at the 10.30 service? I didn't. I was a little caught off guard again. But here's, here's what kind of caught me, made me aware of this, is that at some level, she felt like an outsider to church. And it took me being in a place that she didn't expect to go, oh, well, that's a church that I could go to. That's a church that I wouldn't necessarily feel like an outsider. If you're waiting to find a church full of perfect people, Jesus is going to come back before you find it. <laughs> We've got to be a place where broken people can come and be broken. We've got to be a place where outsiders can come and feel like they belong. They feel like they're accepted. They can break down the barriers. Where people can hear that it doesn't matter what you act like, look like, dress like, smell like, or vote like. We can come into this place and belong and worship Jesus, glorify God, and enjoy his presence. Because inviting people in who feel like outsiders shows the open and loving arms of God to people searching for acceptance. It's what Zacchaeus found. It's what the woman at the well found. And if people feel like they don't belong in church, they feel like they're outsiders, I'm not sure we're doing church right. That's a country club lifestyle. That's not home. Home is a place of belonging. And we need to show others that they are invited in and that they belong. There's some people that, that I know that I've, I've come to know through some of our elders. And um, there's a family that, that I've actually come to know decently well that has been invited over and over and over again to Lighthouse Church. You know what? They won't come on a Sunday morning. They don't feel like they can. They don't feel like they belong. They've come to some of our other stuff, and no matter how many times I've assured them, hey, no, like, you can come. It doesn't matter. Just come on. Their experience with church is that people like them don't belong in church. God, what a heartbreaking idea. So let's change that. Let's invite in the outsiders and show them that this is a place to belong. This is a place where people can come and find Jesus. This is a place where people searching for the spiritual can find it, even if they're not sure what it is when they walk through the doors. Because we know the secret. <laughs> let's be a place of belonging for the outsiders. One more. Jesus also... The fourth, right? He also invited hurting people into peace through faith. One of my favorite stories in scripture is found in John 20, verses 24 and 28. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, behold, we have seen the Lord. The story is happening after the resurrection of Jesus. All his disciples saw him die. And there was a moment where they were all afraid because Jesus had been killed. And so they're, they're kind of terrified that they're going to be next. And they're all huddled in a room together. Well, Jesus wasn't dead anymore. He rose from the dead and shows up in the room. Except here's the problem is Thomas missed it. Thomas wasn't there. And this is what he says in response. When they say, hey, Thomas, we've seen Jesus. And he said to them, unless I see his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and the place my, and place my hand into his side. I will never believe. You see, Thomas is speaking from a place of his hurt and brokenness and pain. He had just seen the man. He dedicated his life to following the man that he thought was the Messiah, which what he was, he is. He saw him die. Everything that they were working towards, it seemed like it came shattering down. And then his friends are telling him that he's alive and he's going, what are you talking about? I saw him die. And eight days later, though, his disciples were inside again, but this time Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. 
And he said, peace be with you. He invited them into peace. Then he looked at Thomas and he said, put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. I mean, here's a guy who several chapters earlier was willing to like run to his own death to follow Jesus. Here's a guy that was one of the the disciples that helped launch the church of Jesus. And you know how we remember Thomas? As a doubting Thomas. Here's the truth, guys. I'm more like Thomas more than anybody probably. I've got my moments of failure and brokenness and pain. Thomas's doubt was directly connected to his pain. But Jesus didn't rebuke or belittle Thomas. He invited him into peace and into understanding. He looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, you're broken. Look at where I was broken for you and have peace. Know that what happened wasn't the end of the story. That I'm alive and we've got more work to do. And I know you're hurt, but it's okay, Thomas, because I was hurt for you. You see, Jesus' invitation moved past Thomas's pain and spoke to his heart to eliminate doubt. Because here's the truth. There, there's a moment that we all are broken. There's a moment where the pain is, all, is overwhelming to us. There's a moments where we doubt But Jesus' invitation into peace and understanding and belonging is something that can make a significant impact. There was a moment in my life. I was young. We were married. We didn't have kids yet. It just seemed like everything was going wrong. I just lost a dear family member to suicide. I just quit a ministry job and felt like I would never be in ministry again. I was working at the deli counter at a grocery store with a great Bible degree, slicing deli meats. And top it all off, I ended up breaking my ankle and having to have surgery and had to even quit that job because I couldn't stand and slice deli meats anymore. If I'm honest, I, I was hurting. I was in pain. And I started wondering if God even cared. And I was at church. I was actually standing in the back so I could lean on a wall, so I could like kind of lean on my crutches in the wall at the same time. And I was sitting in this room, and it was during a worship service. A decently large church. And I remember there's a thought that went through my head. The thought was, you should just leave because God hates you. Never said the thought out loud. But I started to to walk out or crutch out. I I was getting ready to walk out. I had a friend at the time. His name was Brenton Dowdy. He was leading worship. He was standing on stage. He was in the middle of a worship song. I I had never expressed this to him. He didn't know this. I didn't say the concept out loud. It's the first time I think it ever went through my mind. But he looked across the room. And he said out loud into the microphone in front of everyone, Joel Wood, God does not hate you. And in that moment, what my friend Brenton did is he invited me in to a place of belonging, even in the middle of my brokenness and pain. Brenton and I have talked about it several times. And he goes, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I've ever (laughs) done that again. But he said yes to Jesus. And in the moment that didn't seem like it was the right moment in service to invite somebody in, he invited me into a deeper relationship with Jesus. And he let me know that I belonged. What Jesus did for Thomas 2,000 years ago in a room in the Middle East, my friend Brenton did for me about 12 years ago in a room in West Texas. And here's the thing, guys. 
We're going to run into hurting people. We're going to be the hurting people. We're going to find the hurting people. And when we invite hurting people into a place where they belong, that they can be safe, even in the middle of their hurts, we show them that we love them. Here's the truth that hurting, inviting hurting people is important, but as a church, loving hurting people is mission critical. We've got to love the hurting and broken. It's not just a place to invite them to a place of belonging. We've got to be the place of belonging. And that's the truth for each of these areas. We have to hold the standard of lovingly welcoming others when they respond to an invitation. We can invite people to Lighthouse Church. We can be specific. We can be personal. We can invite those searching. We can invite the outsiders and we can invite the broken. But we still have to be the church when they get here and show them that they belong. We have to lovingly sit with them in their brokenness and pain. We've got to listen to their hurts. We've got to be patient with their doubts. We have to be home for people. That's our challenge. Our challenge as a church is that we've got to be a home for our community. And my challenge for you personally today is that you've got to be part of inviting other people into that community, not in a general sense, in a specific sense. I love hearing testimonies of how you invite people to church. I love the testimonies of hearing how you were invited to church. There's power in it. And that's how we're going to be a home for our community. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for each and every one of the men and women, teenagers in this room. God, I pray that we feel the burden to be, to model you and to invite others. Thank you for the power of an invitation. God, I thank you that almost four years ago, I remember where I was standing when I got the invitation to be the lead pastor of Lighthouse Church. I thank you for that joy that I felt that day, and I pray that others would feel the same joy that they have a place that they can belong to in our church community. Let us be men and women who model Jesus for those around us. More than inviting them to a church, let us help, uh, give us the hope of inviting other people into relationship with Jesus. Let us lovingly go from this place to love those around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.